So we're getting to the end of the line on thinking about rate equations as a way to think about biological dynamics. And in some ways, I've probably overdone it a little bit, but um, in a way, I just wanted to showcase the number of different ways that these ideas come up. And we're going to end on a very strong note by thinking about the so-called double negative architecture. And um, before beginning, I guess I want to make a plug for this fantastic book uh, in general, when Sean Carroll writes a book, it's worth reading, but I would put this one kind of above uh, even the, the rest of his great books because it's not only a representation of science for people, the general public to read, but I would actually say that it's full of deep ideas and it elucidates principles in a way that I don't think, I'm not really aware that anybody has, has presented the principles with a sort of a unified framework. So. This book, in some sense, if you like, is the story of double negative feedback. And, um, and I might give a little vignette about the, the story of otters, which I'm going to speak about in a moment. But, you know, I really recommend this book um, because it's inspiring, it's illuminating, it's well thought out, and it, it basically calls out a belief in a principle. And the principle is the principle of double negative regulation writ large. And when I say writ large, I mean that this applies to molecules in regulatory networks. It applies at the level of cholesterol regulation. It applies at the level of ecosystems. So it's like many great principles, it has quite broad reach. So what is the double negative logic? Uh, what I would say on the left is uh, an abstraction that says that there's some controller number one and that controller represses controller number two and controller number two represses the output of which is the final thing and this gives the superficial appearance of being a like uh, controller one as an activator in other words if you didn't know better you might say well i turn on controller one and then somehow output uh, is produced but in fact it's through the intermediary of the second uh, the second molecule in the in the chain and what I wanted to do is let's uh, look at the case on the right, which is a story that Sean tells about the Aleutian Islands, and he's really representing the work of James Estes. And there's a whole beautiful set of stories that go with this. And like I said, I'm pretty inclined to actually give a little bit of a, a vignette about this uh, for enrichment, you know, strictly voluntary. But the idea is that, um, is that otters had been hunted to near extinction you know there probably many of you know that there was a gold rush to the yukon this is the sort of thing that jack london was part of in the 18 somethings and it's interesting because if you read about the history of uh bering and uh stellar so who was the naturalist on the bering expedition they left from the eastern side of russia and they discovered what's now known as the Shumigan Islands, which is to the east of the Aleutians. And the thing that is interesting is that they, in basically as a result of that, they instituted what became a second gold rush, but this gold rush was for furs of otters. And so the otters had been hunted nearly to extinction. In the early 1900s, basically people stopped hunting them. The population came back to between 60 and 80,000, if I remember correctly. And then around 2000 or 90s, the population started to crash again. And one of the consequences of that is that there would be these things called sea urchin barrens. And I, I will say a little bit more about this in another vignette. And the idea is shown here, which is that the otter regulates urchins and urchins regulate the kelp. And once the urchins destroy the kelp, in a certain sense, the reef ecosystem is gone. That's the, that's the rough impression. The one I'm gonna focus on is in the middle and this is uh, the case of the, the famed lac operon. And the idea is that allolactose is an inhibitor of lac repressor, and lac repressor is an inhibitor of the genes which are present in the lac operon, such as beta-galactosidase. And so that's the, the story that I wanna, I wanna walk you through. And um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to mathematicize this. And the thing I wanna do is I wanna talk about uh, R tote as the total number of repressors. And I'm going to say uh, that 
P active uh, of C is equal to, um, I'm, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna derive this uh, in an upcoming vignette, the activity of the repressor can be written in this form, which I'm going, like, like I said, I will derive later. So this is the famed uh, Monod Wyman Change model of Alistair. And what it tells us about is, is it tells us the number of active repressors, which is equal to P act of C times R tote. So what I'm saying is that the, the repressors are either active or inactive, and that depends on how much inducer is around. So C, C is the concentration of the inducer alla lactose. So you can see from this equation that what will happen is that um, is that as we in, increase the amount of allolactose, the number of active repressors actually is going to go down because in the presence of allolactose, the repressor falls off of the DNA. So what I'm trying to say is that this guy is the active state. It binds to the DNA and represses the gene. When one of these molecules binds to the repressor, it inactivates it. Now this, this kind of allosteric behavior can go in either direction. You can either have an inducer which will turn on a molecule or it will turn it off. And here we're talking about the double negative architecture. And so what happens is that it turns it off. Um, again, I, I just want to reiterate, this equation is, it gives rise to a sigmoidal activity curve. And in this case, so here's one, this thing is going to do something like this. So sigmoidal activity curve. And, um, and, and again, I'm going to, I will explain where this equation comes from later, but you know, this is, this is to my mind, a much better realization of cooperativity for many biological situations than the convenient, but phenomenological Hill function. I'm not going to get off on that tangent too much. Now, the, the thing I'm going to argue here is a separation of time scales. And what I mean by that is that repressor activity, it instantaneously follows inducer concentration. And let me show you what I mean by that. So down here, uh, what I want you to notice is, don't, focus, don't worry about this one just yet. This is the concentration of inducer, this curve. So at t equals zero, the inducer is stepped up. And what I want you to note is that instantaneously, the number of active repressors drops to effectively zero. So the point is, is that on the time scale at which the protein is produced from this gene, all the action having to do with induction happens instantaneously. We don't have any, there's no delay at all. So, um, so in terms of our equations, what this means is in this particular case, not in all cases, but in this particular case, the rate of production of the gene, the last object, is minus gamma times gene. That's the usual idea of degradation of the protein or alternatively of uh, cell dilution. And then we have some rate at which the, the gene is synthesized and note, so this is the, the rate of production So production rate 
of G. And let's look at, I mean, we've already encountered this version many times, which is the reason I didn't go through states and weights and all that stuff. So what this is saying, note what happens when RA is high. When RA is high, what that means is that the repressor is turning off the production of the, the downstream gene. RA in turn depends upon the concentration of the inducer. This term over here, which maybe we can label in red, this term is uh, just the degradation. And since we have been through this a number of times, I'm just going to show you the outcome. And this is something that you have done already yourselves in the homework. But this is the outcome. So this curve is the rate of basically the production of the, the protein, the downstream product, in the context of this double negative architecture. So here's the architecture. We had a really important simplifying assumption, which is instantaneous equilibration between allolactose binding and lac repressor activity. And then this thing, the slow reaction, is the repressors bind or unbind from the DNA, and then there's some time frame over which the, the proteins get produced um, from that gene. Okay, so I'm not going to do other calculations, but I just wanted to give you a sense that, you know, this is from Eric Davidson and uh, Isabel Peter in their nice book on gene, gene regulation, and it's just meant to give you a, a, an example from the sea urchin and an example from the fly of the role of double negative architectures in the context of development. And uh, here I show you you know, so this is this is strictly if you want to do this by yourself. So let me just pause for a moment and let you look at the states and weights. So basically, you can see that snail actually um, is a repressor of Tom, and then Tom is a repressor of Delta because of the rate of production there. So you can already anticipate how this is going to work. We will have two coupled equations um, for Tom and for Delta. And we can plot the null clines, as you see here. And basically, uh, this is the fixed point up here. And th this is a particular tra trajectory for one particular instance of the initial conditions. So what have I, what have I tried to convey? I've, I've mainly just tried to introduce you to the ubiquitous nature of double negative regulation, which I show you right here. And how we would mathematicize that uh, in the simplest case. There's some loose ends that I've left. Because this equation for P active, we need to justify that, which I will do um, in an upcoming vignette. But otherwise, that's the essence of things.